this is Killer Stories. I'm your host, Bobby Holmes. I'm back from a much needed break. Outside of celebrating the Thanksgiving holiday, there's been a lot going on in our household. We've had a preschool closure and a two week quarantine. Life's been interesting. Also, I reached my 10,000 downloads last week, so I'm super excited about that milestone. If you follow me on social media, you saw me opening a bottle of Chandon in fear. (laughs) I don't know why, but I get such anxiety about opening champagne. But I managed to not poke my eye out or spill any of the good stuff. Needless to say, this story will more than make up for the fact that you missed one last week. It's beyond disturbing. Like, seriously, f***. I know some people think trigger warnings are silly. I mean, you're tuning in to hear stories about murder. Obviously, it's going to be disturbing. But this case involves sexual abuse, torture, and cruelty to animals. And that's putting it mildly. This story takes place in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Yes, that's the actual name of the town. Truth or Consequences. A little fun fact, apparently the town is named after a game show from the 40s. There was a contest giving towns a chance to change their name to truth or consequences. Hot Springs, New Mexico won this weird contest and changed the name April 1st, 1950. No, not an April Fool's joke. Locals call it T or C, home of the toy box killer. I know what you're thinking. Toy box? That doesn't sound too bad. But if you're picturing the chest in your kid's playroom filled with Barbies and Hot Wheels, it's not that kind of toy box. As per usual, let's talk a little bit about our killer and his upbringing. David Parker Ray was born November 6, 1939. He has a younger sister named Peggy. David's father, like most of the fathers in my stories, you guessed it, a raging alcoholic. He became violently abusive to his wife and the kids when he got drunk, which was like all the time. David's parents divorced when he was 10 years old. His mother pretty much bounced after the divorce. She had her own addictions and they became more important than raising her children. David and Peggy moved in with their grandfather. He was physically abusive too, but only if you broke his rules. He was very, very strict. The kids didn't see their father very often, but when he did decide to show up, he brought gifts for David. Not a normal gift like a baseball mitt or something. His father gave him porno mags. Hardcore kinky shit, which is very inappropriate for David's age. David was introverted, super shy and quiet, which unfortunately made him a target for bullies at school. The mental abuse from bullying started in elementary school, and by high school, he was getting his ass kicked every day. So between school and his home life, David had it pretty rough. To escape, he began experimenting with drugs and alcohol. He had quite the collection of porn from good old dad at this point. He began fantasizing about BDSM, bondage, whipping, the whole nine yards. David would draw out his fantasies on paper. By age 14, he had stacks of magazines and R-rated artwork laying all around his bedroom. As a teen, he started working as an auto mechanic. After high school graduation, he didn't have many options and decided to join the army where he was able to do his mechanical work. David received an honorable discharge, settled down, and got married. He began showing very strange behavior, and he even confided in his wife that he once tied up a woman to a tree where he tortured and killed her. Apparently, she didn't take him seriously. If my husband told me that, I would abandon all my stuff, like, peace out, see you never. But his quote-unquote disturbing behavior continued, and it did eventually lead to divorce. Then he remarried and divorced. Okay, so he was married four times and divorced four times. 
In his four marriages, he had two daughters. It seems like one daughter prefers to stay out of the spotlight and remain anonymous. His other daughter's name is Glenda Jean Ray. Her nickname was Jessie. Truth or Consequences neighbored a smaller town called Elephant Butte. It was home to a huge man-made lake called Elephant Butte Reservoir. It had over 200 miles of shoreline for recreational use. Now this is in the middle of the desert, New Mexico. So over 100,000 people flocked to the water to beat the heat. Unfortunately, so did the homeless population and drifters. It became a known place where drug addicts and sex workers gathered. With that came a very high crime rate. Sadly, police didn't put much effort into solving these crimes because the victims were drug addicts and sex workers. David worked at the Elephant Butte State Park. He met a lovely lady named Cindy Hendy who was doing community service there. A little backstory on Cindy. As a young girl, she experienced sexual abuse at the hands of her stepfather. Cindy confided in her mother, but of course her stepfather denied it. Sadly, her mom didn't believe her. She was kicked out of her house at age 12. 12. What the hell? That's not even old enough to get a job. As you can imagine, this caused severe psychological issues. She didn't show much empathy towards others. She found herself in countless toxic relationships. Most of the time, Cindy was the one displaying physical violence. She had three children, all to different fathers. In 1997, Cindy was arrested for attempting to sell cocaine to an undercover cop. She was supposed to attend a drug counseling course, but instead of doing that simple task like a law-abiding citizen, Cindy decided she would rather skip town. She ventured south and ended up in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. It didn't take long before Cindy landed herself a DUI, and that's how she ended up doing community service at the Elephant Butte National Park. Her and David hit it off from the get-go, but as they spent more time together, they realized they had a common interest, sadism. They enjoyed causing pain and humiliation to others. Before you know it, the two were a couple and Cindy moved in to David's double-wide trailer in Truth or Consequences. Together, they bought a soundproof trailer and put it on the back of his property. They called this trailer the Toy Box. They abducted women, usually sex workers, and kept them for days, weeks, or even months as their sex slaves. David decorated the walls of the trailer with torn out pages from his hardcore BDSM porno magazines. Ammonia tabs and chloroform were available if they needed to subdue the women. On the walls hung branding irons, paddles, whips, chains, electrocution clamps, and suction cups. For some reason I can't fathom, there was a fur-lined coffin inside as well. The drawers were equipped with surgical tools, power tools, and sex toys. Like, very intimidating sex toys. David also used his skills as a mechanic to create his own toys. He made a, no other way to describe it, an automatic dildo, 15 inches. One that would penetrate rapidly and forcefully on its own. Another one was made from a large PVC pipe, and he added spikes sticking out from the base. This is cringeworthy. This thing looks way too wide to fit inside of any human being. But he would use this on the women, causing major damage with the upward-facing spikes. He also made his own gynecologist table with stirrups. It was able to tilt forward and backward into whatever position he desired. Ankle spreaders are a common thing used in BDSM, and if you consent and you're into that kind of thing, more power to you. 
but the spreaders he used would spread their legs so far apart that it popped hips out of place. He had a full-length mirror that hung directly above the table, so his victims were forced to watch. He was not alone in the raping. Sometimes he would have friends over to play in the toy box. Not only that, but he forced the rape of his male dogs on the women. He would also take gravy and cover the women's crotch. Oh, this is like, I can't even say it. And watch as his dogs, you know, like, I, ugh. On the walls of the toy box was a written reminder for those who were there to play. Quote, remember, a woman will do or say anything to get loose. They will kick, scratch, offer money, bite, yell, beg, scream, run, offer sex, threaten, lie, wait for opportunity. Standard excuses and sob stories. Menstruating, pregnant, venereal disease, AIDS, sick, kids with babysitter, have to work, a sick baby, a sick parent, claustrophobia, missed by husband or friend, bad heart, can't miss school. Don't let her get to you. If she was worth taking, then she's worth keeping. And she must be subjected to hypnosis before the woman can safely be released. Never trust a chained captive. Unquote. So, there's an audio tape that played at the end of the torture session. One that David believed hypnotized women into forgetting what happened to them. A woman named Angelica was kept for five days in the toy box. Cindy actually knew Angelica. They weren't close friends, but she was the one who lured her into David's house. At first, Angelica thought it was a prank, and she was really confused. But after a while, she realized the best way to get out of the situation is to not fight back. Act like a willing participant. David said if he knew she was going to be so nice, he would have never picked her up. He gets off on the fact that the women are scared and they try to resist. She basically was chatting with Cindy and David on a friendly basis by the end of it, and David decided to let her go. He made her promise to keep quiet and dropped Angelica off in the middle of the desert. Not left with many options, Angelica stuck out her thumb to hitch a ride to Albuquerque. She was eventually picked up by Deputy Gary Labor, who was headed in that direction. Angelica stayed pretty silent, but after a while she looked over and said, You'll never believe what just happened to me. She nonchalantly told him that she had been abducted, raped, and tortured by a couple. She had details about what happened, but something was off about the way she was telling the story with no emotion. It almost seemed like she was making it up. The deputy offered to take her to give a statement to the police, but she declined. She didn't seem upset or like she wanted any resolution. She was just simply telling him what happened. Once they arrived in Albuquerque, he dropped her off at a bus stop, and that was that. He didn't report her claims because he wasn't too sure that it actually happened. In March of 1999, David parked his motorhome in a well-known area for prostitution in Elephant Butte. He had a friend direct a young woman named Cynthia Vigil his way and explained David was in need of her services. David described to Cynthia what he wanted. She agreed and climbed in. David flashed a fake badge, told her he was police and that she was under arrest for solicitation. At first, she didn't question David because she was indeed a sex worker, and she was also high on heroin at the time. He moved her to the back of the motorhome where Cindy emerged to help handcuff her. That's when Cynthia realized something was off. These people didn't seem like real cops, and she tried to fight back. It took Cindy threatening her with a cattle prod to stop her from thrashing long enough to be cuffed. They drove Cynthia back to the double wide where they chained her to a bed in the living room, each limb chained to the four corners of the bed. They placed a metal collar around her neck, which was fastened to the wall behind her. David set down a tape recorder and pressed play. 
This is an audio recreation of David Parker Ray that he played for his victims. Hello there, bitch. Are you comfortable right now? I doubt it. Wrists and ankles chained, gagged, probably blindfolded. You are disoriented and scared too, I would imagine. Perfectly normal under the circumstances. For a little while, at least, you need to get your shit together and listen to this tape. It is very relevant to your situation. I'm going to tell you, in detail, why you have been kidnapped, what's going to happen to you, and how long you'll be here. I don't know the details of your capture, because this tape is being created July 23rd, 1993, is a general advisory tape for future female captives. The information I'm going to give you is based on my experience dealing with captives over a period of several years. If, at a future date, there are any major changes in our procedures, the tape will be upgraded. Now, you are obviously here against your will. Totally helpless. Don't know where you're at. Don't know what's going to happen to you. You're very scared or very pissed off. I'm sure that you've already tried to get your wrists and ankles loose. No, you can't. Now you're just waiting to see what's going to happen next. You probably think you're going to be raped, and you're f***ing sure right about that. Our primary interest is in what you've got between your legs. You'll be raped, thoroughly and repeatedly, in every hole you've got. Because, basically, you've been snatched and brought here for us to train and use as a sex slave. Sound kind of far out? Uh, I suppose it is to the uninitiated, but we do it all the time. It's going to take a lot of adjustment on your part, and you're not going to like it a f***ing bit. But I don't give a big rat's ass about that. It's not like you're going to have any choice about the matter. You've been taken by force, and you're going to be kept and used by force. What all this amounts to is that you're going to be kept naked and chained up like an animal to be used and abused any time we want to, any way that we want to. You might as well start getting used to it because you're going to be kept here and used until such time as we get tired of f***ing around with you. Okay, that's enough. Guys, this is just the intro. It goes on and on. 50 minutes of David explaining in graphic detail what he's going to do to you. It's horrific. The entire recording is available on YouTube if you want to hear the sicko. Search David Parker Ray tape. I believe this one was posted by YouTuber I calls him like I sees him. Your jaw will be on the floor. After playing the tape, the sexual abuse begins. She was kept there for three days. David and his girlfriend Cindy took turns watching after Cynthia. One morning, David unchained Cynthia's arms and legs so that she could stretch out. She was still chained to the wall by her neck collar. David left for work and Cynthia was alone with Cindy. Late morning, the phone rang and Cindy answered. She sets down the keys on the coffee table and walks into the next room. Cynthia can't believe it. This is her chance. She reaches her foot out far enough to hook it around one of the legs of the coffee table and pulls it closer. She's able to reach out and grab the keys and start unlocking herself. Just then, Cindy walks back into the living room. She sees that Cynthia has the keys, drops the phone, and jumps on her. The two are full-on wrestling each other. Cindy reaches for the closest item she can get her hands on, which happens to be a lamp, and breaks it over Cynthia's head. But Cynthia is determined to get out of there. While fighting off Cindy, she reaches around. For whatever reason, there's an ice pick nearby. Cynthia used the ice pick to stab Cindy in the side of her head and took off running through the front door. 
She was buck naked and still had a large metal collar around her neck with a chain attached. She was running down the road trying to flag down someone for help. She was passed up by a few people, which is terrible, but honestly, picture this. You're driving and you spot a hysterical naked woman, dirty, bruised, and bloody, wearing only a metal collar trying to get your attention. If I were by myself, I would probably be hesitant to help. But that's also the paranoid true crime expert in me. I would expect it to be part of a distraction where once I pulled over, someone else is going to jump me. Anyways, Cynthia keeps running, frantically looking for help. She gets to a neighboring trailer and literally just runs inside an unlocked front door and begs for help. She startled a woman named Darlene who was inside watching TV. Her husband Donald came out of the back room when he heard the commotion. Cynthia had blood-soaked hair. Her breasts were black and blue. She had burn marks and bruising all over her thighs. She begged them to help remove the collar from her neck. The couple's unsure how to do it safely, and they decide it's better to just grab her a bathrobe and call 911. Cynthia was taken to a local hospital to be evaluated and interviewed by criminal investigators. A maintenance man was called in to use bolt cutters to remove the metal collar. Once it fell from her neck, Cynthia grabbed it and threw it, wanting as far away from the memory of what happened as possible. Okay, guys, I'm going to stop here for today, and I literally hate the anticipation of having to wait a week for the rest of the story. I'm sorry to do it to you. I'll be back next week to fill you in on what happened after Cynthia's escape. There's so much more to this story. Be sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss a new episode of Killer Stories. I greatly appreciate reviews left on Apple Podcasts or my Facebook page. Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok is at Killer Stories Podcast. My Twitter handle is at Killer Stories PC. Email any story suggestions to Killer Stories Podcast at gmail.com. If you want to support the show, visit buymeacoffee.com slash killer stories. There you can give a one-time donation and leave me a note if you feel so inclined. It helps cover the cost of the monthly publication of this podcast. Thank you so much for listening and tuning in each week to hear me rant about murder. Until next time, this has been a killer story. <laughs>